Ahmad Unsara Damabad Surya MBE MBBS Ceylon PhD London BSc Rona RCP London FRCP Edinburgh FRCP Glasgow FRCP CHUK FCCP FSLCP FSLGP BCH England who is the Emeritus Professor of Pediatrics of the Faculty of Medicine University of Colombo. His long and distinguished career culminating in him assuming the position of Dean of the Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo, in August 2002. A position which he held with distinction until he stepped down in August 2005 and President of the Asia Pacific Association of Pediatricians from 2007 to 2009, giving leadership to the entire pediatric community in the Asia Pacific region is well known. It is difficult for me to do justice to his CV in a short citation such as this. I shall only deal with the highlights of his career. In preparation for this citation, I asked him whether there was anything that I should not miss out. I got a prompt reply. Having known him, from my student days, I thought to myself that I could have guessed it myself because I know that he has been an outspoken proponent on the need for clinicians to undertake research and read for research degrees. He was one of the first, if not the first clinician in Sri Lanka to obtain a PhD and that too in only two years of study at the University of London. <coughs> Since those early beginnings, he has published over 150 papers and delivered guest lectures, convocation addresses and orations in, in many countries around the world, too numerous to mention here. He entered academia as a lecturer in pediatrics in the Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo, in 1969. In 1980, he joined the newly established Faculty of Medicine of the University of Rahuna as its foundation professor of pediatrics a position he held till 1991 when he returned back to the University of Colombo to take up the position of <coughs> senior professor and head of department of pediatrics after the retirement of Professor Riani Soeza. He has served overseas on many occasions especially in the UK. The most noteworthy of these, however, is the two years from 1987 to 1988, when he served as Professor of Pediatrics and Pediatric Gastroenterology at the College of Medicine and Medical Sciences of the King Faisal University in Dama, in Dama, in South Saudi Arabia. Child Health Foundation Fellowship Prize for Social Pediatrics awarded by the World Health Organization and the International Pediatric Association in 1987-88. Honorary membership of the British Pediatric Association 
in April 1994, Honorary Fellowship of the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health in 1997, Outstanding Pediatrician for, uh, for Asia Award, awarded at the 9th Asian Congress of Pediatrics in Hong Kong in March 1997 by the Association of Pediatric Societies in the Southeast Asian region. Fellowship of the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health in 1997 and Honorary Senior Fellow of the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine University of Colombo in 2008 and member of Immunization Practices Advisory Committee of the World Health Organization in 2010. His service to the Royal Colleges in the UK, the University of Colombo, the Postgraduate Institute of the University of Colombo, the World Health Organization, and various professional colleges and associations are too numerous to mention here. On a post personal note, I had the good fortune of having been his student and thereafter a junior colleague in the academic staff of the Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo. On my return back to Sri Lanka after my PhD in 2004, I visited him in his office to inform him that I had come back. He was a dean at that time. He asked me, what can you do with your training? I explained. He wanted me to give a proposal to set up a molecular genetic diagnostic laboratory. Once the proposal was submitted, the money was immediately released from the faculty development fund on his personal recommendation. Thereafter, he helped us to obtain a large loan uh, to be paid back by charging for fees, services from the university to expand the cytogenetic services. That is how Professor Rohan Jayasekar and I were able to expand the genetic diagnostic services in our unit during the past decade. We are grateful for you, uh, to you, sir, for that. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to request Professor Lama Bansuria to come forward to receive the medal and deliver the endowment lecture. I would like to thank the President and the Council of SLMA for inviting me to deliver this very prestigious lecture on this occasion. Professor Priyani Sayyidha, the Chairman of the Board of Trustees, past presidents of the SLMA, councillors, members of the SLMA, distinguished invitees, ladies and gentlemen. To this very eminent person, Dr. E. M. Vijayra, he was born on the 6th of August in 1896 and he died in December 1980. He was born at Coastwater and educated initially at Rajapaksha College and later on at Royal College Colombo. He obtained LMS Ceylon in 1922 and then he proceeded to the UK for postgraduate studies where he was based at University College Hospital in London. He was a contemporary of Dr. Max Rosenheim, doctor at that time, later on Lord and they became lifelong friends. During this time, he obtained his MD and MRCP. In 1935, he was appointed, as it was called then, visiting physician of General Hospital Colombo, which post he held this distinction until he retired in 1956. He held many important posts. He was the president of the Ceylon Medical Council. 
He was the pre uh, president of the Ceylon Medical Association in 1947. He was the founder president of the Ceylon College of Physicians. He was the president of the GMOA. He was the first fellow of the Ceylon College of Physicians. He was closely involved in the development of the Ceylon Medical Library. He was a member of the University Court. Rather late in his life, few months before he died, his services to the profession was recognized by the University of Jaffna by conferring on him the honorary Doctor of Science. He was closely involved in many Buddhist activities, the YMBA, and the, Ceylon, uh, the Colombo Municipal Council decided to rename McCarthy Road as Vijayarama Mahatma. In 1962, he realized with his close involvement of the Ceylon Medical Association, who were moving from one building to another, that it was necessary for them to have a proper place to conduct his activities and also for the Ceylon Medical Library to be housed uh, at a, a suitable location. And he and his wife decided to donate their house, that is these premises, to the SLMA in 1962. Of course, it took a few more years for the SLMA to move into the pre uh, premises, uh, sorting out legal issues and cutting through red tape. So, that is the person we are gathered here today to pay our respect to. And traditions are extremely important. And I sincerely hope these traditions will be carried on and on. So, this day, there are only two people in our profession who have gifted their houses to the profession. Dr. Vijay Rama and the late Dr. Noel Bartholomew, the surgeons have benefited by their you know, gracious gifts. I have chosen the topic of research and beyond for tonight's oration. Out of this string of qualifications which I have acquired over a period of time, I consider two to be the most important. Of course, I think the most difficult exam that I passed was, I think, the university entrance exam, which was the most competitive even at that time. Because if we did not pass that exam, <coughs> we wouldn't have been here today. So that's not the foundation. Then I consider the research degree that I got from the University of London to be a very, very important degree that I acquired because that has helped me in my academic career right throughout my life. This is one definition of research which says it includes any gathering of data, information, and facts for the advancement of knowledge. In which case, who is a researcher? Researchers are professionals engaged in the conception or creation of new knowledge, products, processes, methods, or systems, and the management of the projects that are concerned. What is the current situation regarding research in Sri Lanka? This slide illustrates our position in the region as well as globally. As you can see, there are only about 200 researchers per million population in Sri Lanka compared to the thousands in some of the other countries. So we are far behind. This slide illustrates the financial resources that are granted for research and development 
And in this global scale, we are given only 0.11% of the growth expenditure for research and development. Whereas you can see the percentages <coughs> in some of the other countries, way above us. I think we are only ahead of Indonesia. Sorry to say that. So we are far behind. That 0.11% accounted for a little over 5,000 million or US dollars, 46 million. Another way of gauging the research that is conducted is by looking at the patencies that have been given. In the year 2008, the total number was only 168 and Sri Lankans only 98 and the balance non-Sri Lankans. The postgraduate degrees that were given in 2008, there are only 24 PhDs, 200 odd MSRs and MDs, 73 MPhils, over 600 MSCs and, uh, in, uh, and engineering diplomas, postgraduate diplomas over 300, a total of only 1,292. And the background is that this research was carried out in 31 state research institutes, 17 universities and few, few private sector industries. There are only a little over 4,000 researchers in research related jobs. And the disturbing trend that were noted was that declining numbers of researchers from approximately 6,000 in 1996 to 4,000 in 2008 maybe due to any pollution. So the current Sri Lankan situation, the number of researchers with PhDs is 1,138. Number of researchers with MPhils and MSCs, 1,000. And 61% of all researchers are in the higher education system, that is in the 17 universities. There are more than 2,000 potential trainers for research degrees in Sri Lanka universities alone. But in spite of that, the average output of PhDs and MPhils from all 70 universities is only 25 to 50 per year. If you compare our figures with the rest of the world, The number of researchers per billion inhabitants, world average, is 894. For developed countries, it's over 3,000. For developing countries, it's close to 400. And even in that category, we are far behind. And we need approximately 18,000 research personnel, that is four times the present number, to be engaged in research today. More data. Postgraduate research degrees are awarded only by the universities. Very low numbers of university academics are actually engaged in research and development, only about 5 to 20 percent. Potential trainers in the university system, according to UGC statistics, in 78 faculties and 425 departments was 2,161. The total academic staff was 3,800 odd and is a breakdown. And research degrees constitute less than 2.5% of the total postgraduate output by all Sri Lankan universities. There was a stronger focus on undergraduate education in all Sri Lankan universities. Postgraduate to undergraduate student ratio varying from 1.5 to 1.129 in the 15 universities of Sri Lanka, compared to about, as compared to about 7.6 in the IIT, IIT, 7 to 6 in the IIT of India. What are the issues in postgraduate research training in Sri Lanka? As I pointed out, there are low numbers and they got, take a longer duration to complete it. In our, amongst our scientists, there is poor publication culture. They talk a lot, 
but they don't put it down on paper. They are full of anecdotes, but no audits, no proper studies. And unfortunately, most of our current MD training programs do not have a research component. Because of this, the National Science Foundation has evolved a support scheme for supervision of research degrees called SUSPREP. This is meant for supervisors of postgraduate research degrees, that's for MPhils and PhDs in all areas of science and technology. The objectives of SUSPREP is to motivate senior researchers to supervise postgraduate research degrees to encourage universities and research institutions to promote and facilitate postgraduate research training, to encourage supervisors to complete the postgraduate research degrees within the stipulated time without compromising on the quality, and to encourage research items to be published in index journals. Because if you publish in a non-index journal, only the people who have access to that journal will know about it. If it is indexed, then of course it's open to all. So the expected outcome of these objectives is to strengthen the national research system with increased number of trained and qualified research personnel within a vibrant and dynamic research culture. The eligibility criteria given there, I don't have to read it out. And the rest of the criteria also given in that slide. Emphasis is on completion of it during a particular period of time and also to pu publishing it or getting a patency out of it based on the quality of the research. And as incentives, a cash award is given for the supervisors or the supervisory team. Uh, if it is a PhD, it's 300,000 to be shared by the supervisors and for an MPL 200,000. Then several grants are given for supervisors or for the students to present the paper based on the research at the international conference. And one million for infrastructure development would be given to institutions if a minimum of three research degrees are produced within a year, and that is to improve the research facilities of that department or division. So these are, I think, uh, encouraging ideas to promote research in our profession. What could be the other incentives for research? I think as it is there are merit promotions based on research, so the universities have already established. Then there are presidential awards. Every year there are presidential awards in different categories. Then travel grants should be given, I think so that our young researchers will be able to uh, attend international conferences, present their data, and more importantly, mix up with their colleagues from different countries, share ideas, you see, of common interest, and improve and increase the networking. That is how research grows. Then to give a research allowance, I think the Ministry of Health has quite rightly recognized it rather late, but now a research allowance is being offered to medical officers if they fulfill certain criteria. And also, I think for academics in universities, they should be given leave of absence to, to obtain a research degree at an opportune time. The basic guidelines for research, of course, it has to have ethical approval. One should avoid plagiarism, avoid duplication, and maximum dissemination. There is no point in keeping the research to yourself. You have to present it at various meetings and also publish in index journals. There are various funding agents for research. The National Research Council, the National Science Foundation, National Health Research Council, Sri Lanka Medical Association, professional colleges, universities, and international agencies such as the WHO. Now, right at the start, I mentioned that the most valuable degree that I have acquired, other than the MBS, is the PhD. And at this stage, I would like to pay a tribute 
the recipient, one of the recipients of a life membership and that is Professor Priyani Swaisa. Because when I was abroad, after I had finished my two, the, the exam that I went for, MRCP and ECH, I had some time left and then I got on to research. And very quickly, my supervisor said, if you want to, you can register for a PhD. I needed a little extra time because one had to wait there for a minimum of two years to get a PhD. The dean at that time uh, was not keen on extending my leave. I had leave only for two years because physicians are given leave only for two years, while those in the non critical departments are given leave for three years or more. So I wanted only a third year, which the dean did not grant. Professor Priyani Soisa, who was the head of the department at that time, she fought tooth and nail to get that year for me. And I was in the middle of my PhD. And I'm thankful to her for giving me that important support at that time of my career. And if I didn't get that leave, perhaps, I don't think I would have returned to Sri Lanka. I would have been a fool to give up all my research and come back because the leave was not extended. So thank you, madam, for the support you gave me. Now, I don't know whether you all will agree. This is my personal recommendation and I have brought this up at faculty board meetings. I feel that every academic in a medical faculty should acquire a research degree during their career. And now I think it is happening. There are few in the audience who are clinicians who have got research degrees. Now it is happening. And I strongly feel that all PGIA MD programs should have a research component. Now, the predecessor to the PGIM was the Institute of Postgraduate Medicine, which was established in the 1970s. And Professor K. N. Seniviratna was the director of the IPGM. And we were sort of colleagues at that time in the Kalamba Medical Faculty, and his idea was to have a research component in the postgraduate training because up to that time we were sent abroad to get the MRCP or the FRCS. And he said, we'll have a local research, uh, we'll have a local degree with a research component. So he was a man of vision and that was his idea. But things changed, he was replaced, the name of the institute was replaced and of course it's another story. Even at this stage, I strongly feel that all these training programs should have a research, a research component. Now, one of the common things that we mentioned is that we don't have facilities for research. But I dare say that sophisticated technology is not always required for research. I think some, most of you all will be aware of what the story about the discovery of phototherapy. <coughs> The location was the Rochford Hospital in Essex in UK. It was just a chance observation by a charge nurse during the summer, which are followed up by medical staff. What this nurse observed was that during the summer, when newborn babies were put out in the lawn, that those who were jaundiced, she thought that in the areas that were not covered by the clothes, which were exposed to the sun, appeared to be less yellow. That is what she observed. And she mentioned this to the medical staff. They just poo pooed her, said this uh, sort of imagination of this old nurse, and they didn't take much notice. Later on, what happened was there was a jaundice baby in the same unit, and the pediatrician wanted a serum bilirubin level estimator. So the blood was taken, and when he came for the water round in the afternoon, he asked for the level, and this baby was deeply jaundiced. And that level was quite low. I mean, this happens regularly in our hospitals. But, of course, the clinician did not go on to assess this report. And he rang up the lab and spoke to the biochemist. He said, this baby is severely jaundiced and you have sent this report. You have to check on your reagents. So the biochemist also stood his ground. He said, okay, I will do that and I will 
I have the specimen, I will test it again. He tested it again and the value was low. Then they went into it in great detail. To see, the blood was taken into a plain bottle. It was kept on the windowsill. And the porter had taken a long time to take it from the ward to the lab. So at the time that it was on the windowsill, sunlight had played on that bottle. And that's the reason why that level was low. So the pediatrician at that time, Dr. Krema in that unit, he put two and two together the chance observation by the nurse and what happened to that water and uh, that caused the discovery of phototherapy. So it was just theo observation. That was documented in the Lancet in 1958 uh, but it took some years for it to be put into practice. And uh, as a result of this, you see, there was a drastic reduction in exchange transfusions. I think the senior pediatrician brain at the time that we had to bend our backs and do exchange transfusion and now of course it's very much less. And there was no expensive equipment involved in the discovery of phototherapy. Now I would like to get on uh, about seizing of chance opportunity. Now you may wonder what this is all about. When I was in Gaul, we were based at Mahamud, but there was no Karabi at this time. This was in uh, 1982. At that time, uh, for relaxation, I used to go to the Gaul service at club in the evenings to play a game of billiards, because that was the way that I used to relax at that time. And when I went to play a game of billiards, the bartender who is to do work as a laboratory attendant in the technical college at Kaluel used to moonlight and work as a bartender in the golf service club in the evenings. He said, Sir, tell you what up here. So he knew my name and he gave me this aerogram. Dear Professor Lamabhadu Surya, the name is spelled very correctly. <laughs> My friend and colleague, Dr. Ibrahim, has already written to you and outlined an international research project which I would like to coordinate between various centers in the world. He kindly suggested that you may be able to help. In summary, I would hope to be able to examine a number of patients who have unoperated clefts of the lip and palate, and we wondered if there were any such group in your country. There has been a lengthy controversy for the past 30 years in which many surgeons claim that there is no evidence that surgery to the palate is in any way responsible for subsequent poor facial growth. There is some evidence from untreated groups, but this is poorly documented and somewhat anecdotal in nature. I am fairly convinced that we would see relatively normal facial growth in patients who have not been operated upon. Ideally, a group of at least 10, though preferably in excess of 20, would be a useful start. For my part, I would wish to take dental impressions, photographs, and possibly some x-rays to be able to assess arch form, skeletal relationships, and growth. Patients of all ages would be welcome. I intend to gather a team of British experts in this field, who would include a plastic surgeon, an anesthetist, an oral surgeon, and possibly a speech therapist, if operating facilities and post-operative care were available. We could provide a service to these patients as well, of course, as tucking them. I look forward to hearing from you. Many thanks, yours sincerely. And this person was not known to me at that time. Michael Mars, Senior Registrar in Orthodontics, Hospital for Sick Children, Great Common Street, London. And I responded positively. What I did during the next few weeks and months was that I wrote to some of my colleagues and I collected some patients in unoperated cleft lips and palate in and around balls. 
and Dr. Michael Mark and a maxillofacial surgeon, Dr. David James from Great Ormond Street, they came on a pilot trip and they saw about 30 odd patients. They took photographs, dental impressions, etc. They didn't talk much. And uh, then they told me that they were quite impressed with the critical material that we have and that they would like to come again. I said, you are welcome. But if you come again, the patients also should benefit from your visit. It's not the one way thing. Then they said, of course, what facilities can you offer? There was no karapiti, as I said. There was only Mahamodara, with only two operating theatres. And I had spent some time in Britain, so I knew what the British are like. I said, I can provide you with an operating theatre, a table and a light. Assume that nothing else is available. That's what I told them. Then they said, we'll go back and think about it and try to raise funds. So that was the start of this project, with this letter. Now the issue was the cause of the facial deformity. As you can see, the middle third of the face is sustained, poor maxillary growth. The controversy was whether it is embryologically determined or whether it is a result of surgery. And unoperated patients with tripas and phallus and lips were not found in that part of the world. But there were plenty of such patients in Sri Lanka. Now, Michael Moss has written this letter to some other countries also. I think Kenya, India and a couple of other places. Later on I asked him, what made you select Sri Lanka? And these are some of the reasons that he gave. This is his slide, not mine, uh, for selecting Sri Lanka. Where I think the high literacy rate went a long way. And of course our system was based on the British model. And our professionals, they were very fluent in English. So that was, I think, one of the important things. And of course a small island with a good road network for patients to travel. So, their first visit was in 1984. And the aims were treatment, teaching, research, and long-term follow-up. That's Michael Maas, the co-director of the project, based in London. That's Alex Hebel, who came on later on, pediatrician from the West Middlesex Hospital. Now, for the first surgical expedition, I had to gather more patients. So I had pay particles, and I informed colleagues, and went on television and collected a lot of patients. When they came to know that a team was coming from Britain, they thought that they can get all their eggs and face solved. And even people with bumps on heads, they replied. So we had to prioritize. And group one were unoperated just with or without palate, uh, just palate, and group two unoperated just palate. We only dealt with these two categories. Mind you, the larger group were miscellaneous disabilities like a lump on the head or a swollen right foot. So they raised funds. And finally, the first surgical team arrived with 30 crates of equipment which were airlifted. And the members of the visiting team consisted of maxillofacial surgeons, plastic surgeons, anesthetists, ENT surgeons, orthodontists, pediatricians, audiologists, speech therapists, dental surgeons, dental nurses, theater nurses. And those boxers contained surgical gloves, boots, syringes, needles, drip sets, the whole lot, because I told them that I can only provide a table and a theater lab. That's a team photograph that was taken during one of the visits. 
Now, Mahamudra Hospital, I said, had only two theatres. And the only theatre time that was available was during the night. So these surgeons, they used to come in at about 8 in the night, operate right throughout the night, and leave at about 5 in the morning for the theatres to be cleaned and we get ready for the local surgeons. And they used to re retire to the NOH in the fort, uh, in the uh, ball fort, and they welcomed, they used to be welcomed with a rack cocktail, which they liked very much at that time in the morning. They used to sleep it out, and later on they used to go to Unavakuna to relax in the afternoon, and they used to come back in the night to do surgery. That was their routine. And Gaul was a sort of a sleepy old town. They didn't have much distractions. There were no nightclubs, no big hotels. So this was the routine that they got used to, and I think that was one of the reasons for the success of the project. No distractions. There were extensive investigations that were done. Dental uh, impressions for dental study models, photographs, lateral skull photo uh, radiographs with a careful step. Uh, speech recordings uh, and uh, audio and video recording, nasal endoscopies, lateral x rays with the patient's coordinating, psychosocial questionnaire, psychosocial interviews, audiological assessments, pediatric assessments. And I must say, the medical students who are volunteers who assisted in all these things, they were wonderful. They enjoyed their work very well. And uh, I can remember from that second row in a batch, uh, Professor Sujiva Amartya was one of those who assisted in this project quite early. So there were several surgical visits. Later on they moved to uh, Candy as well, to the Peravania uh, Teaching Hospital, Dental Hospital. And there were several visits uh, to collect data because there was a long term follow up project. And, uh, in 1997, uh, the first speech and language therapy uh, graduate program was established in Kalani. Overall, there were three surgical expeditions and 740 operations were performed without a single mortality. Now, these are summary of the benefits of the Cleft Alert project. Over 700 patients of all ages underwent successful surgery. And it created the largest database of unoperated cleft lips and colors in the world. It created awareness and helped to establish specialized units in Gaul, Colombo and Peradin. Lady Ridgeway Hospital has an excellent unit headed by Dr. Ramesh Punasekar. And Dr. Sriyani Vasnayak, orthodontist, is closely involved in this work. And Marsha Jayatilka is one of the speech therapists assisting these patients. And uh, to set up the training facility for speech therapists with a donation of 250,000 pounds from an anonymous donor. Although she was anonymous at that time, later on I met her. And uh, she herself had had, I think, palatal surgery because she had a bit of a lisp. And she wanted to donate some money because she has, was responsible for the, uh, I think, for the stage class of Phantom of the Opera. And every time it was stage, she got her royalties and she had excess money and she was donated some project. And the Later on, the BBC made a film called When to Men Faces in Gaul, which was shown on the QED series in the UK. A copy of that film was sent to her, and she decided to donate that money to set up a speed therapy training facility in Sri Lanka. There were several academic benefits. At that time, the Rohuna Medical Faculty, which had just started in 1980, having teething problems about getting recognition for the GNC. And they sent someone, I think, to assess the place, visited the different departments, and then wanted a feedback. And of course, I gave a string of names for this person to go and contact. And I heard later on that they were contacted, the visiting, and they recommended Gaul very highly. And that assisted us in getting recognition from the GNC. 
and of course you of us receive for royal honors. The academic output of the Cliffhanger project, there were four PhDs, one MD, 13 MSCs, there were two Sri Lankan MSCs, then several guest lectures and orations, and several publications, books, chapters, etc. And it was not a surgical safari for them to come and operate and go back. The thing was to sustain, that is extremely important, when we get to the foreign teams come here, sustainability is extremely important. And they conducted various master class clinics, extensive lecture programs, and our trainees, they had hands on surgical orthodontics, speech and language therapy, ENT and audiology, the pediatric nursing and anesthesia training, and of course this speech therapy program. And some of the medical professionals, they were provided facilities, travel grants, and given placements uh, for them to work in places like Great Ormond Street, but then to be further trained. There were surgical fellowships, orthodontic fellowships, etc. Then, of course, during the project, there were few cultural problems. That's uh, Frank Abbey Holmes, a very reputable plastic surgeon from Norway, who was one of the visiting team. Then, of course, Michael Mars used to refer to what he called our door population. Our people are very inquisitive. The moment you see there was a little space, they used to, had quite a lot used to gather and pay through the door to see what was happening. And Michael said that they had not seen a sort of a white, balding giant for some time. And that's why probably they were so inquisitive. And as I said, there are quite a mix of patients from <coughs> infants to adults with various flexibility patterns, unilateral, bilateral, you name it, they had it. Uh, these uh, patients who were featured in that film that were made by the BBC, they came from one of the estate plantations and this was her appearance before surgery and few years later they came uh, for a follow-up visit and that person had been transformed. This is another example of a patient who was followed up after surgery, operated and at 15 years, 16 years and later on at 25 years. Another adult, young adult who have been transformed. This is Sam, Michael Mars is very fond of this patient. Samuel, he was a carpenter from Bhattegam. He was so horrible, although he was a talented carpenter, he never went in search of work because he was too shy to venture out and people used to bring him work, so his income was limited. And they decided to operate on him and this is what he looked like later on. And with the change in appearance, he used to go out of the house in search of work and his income gradually increased. It, drastically, it, it uh, increased drastically. These are some of the dental scars that have been taken uh, from these patients prior to surgery. And now I think I don't want to bore you too much about the Clefthaler project. My title is Research and Beyond. What do I mean by beyond? The facilities for speed therapy in Sri Lanka was really pathetic when the project was started. There was only one speed therapist for the whole of Sri Lanka and she was in the private sector. I think some of you all know who this lady is. And as I told you, we got a donation of 250,000 pounds sterling to set up training. And training for Professor Carlo Fonseca and Professor Priyani Saisa who molded my career after choosing medicine as my future career. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being here tonight and for your patience here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise until
the profession is joyful. And join us out there for the